Hello and welcome to Sinner to Winner podcast. This is episode five. Today we are joined by Breatholution, Kevin O'Neill. Kevin, welcome. Hi, Jazz. Thank you so much for having me on, mate. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure having you. Uh, a lot of people are going to know who you are. You're kind of a big deal in this cold water therapy. You're a practitioner, facilitator, teacher. But for those that don't know who you are, give us a little uh, give us a little spiel. Yeah, so um, so yeah, I established uh, Breathe Illusion, uh, which is the name of uh, my 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 business, in in two thousand and twenty, um, and it just kind of happened really. Creating Breathe Illusion, it just happened by mistake. Uh, struggled with addiction for 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 years and um, ADHD. I've got ADHD. I've probably had it all my life. Uh, struggled with asthma and allergies and hay fever, all sorts of other stuff. And yeah, literally just kind of switched my life around when. I quit alcohol, which I know is close to your heart as well, which is kind of why we, why we met each other really, isn't it? You know, back in the day, um, and uh, yeah, it's all kind of just gone gone crazy from there. I'm a, uh, a Buteco instructor, Oxygen Advantage, Advanced Oxygen Advantage instructor with um, with the um, wonderful Patrick McKeown in Ireland with his team, and uh, I'm a cold water therapist. So yeah, working with people's nervous system dysregulation if you like uh, trying to get people regulated and connecting the dots mate as you're speaking here i'm thinking you're like a modern day john the baptist aren't you really <laughs> I, don't know about that. I think you're closer <laughs> to him love to be honest that's but, yeah. brilliant oh mate that's it oh i'm you sure i'm still waiting for you to baptize me again yeah we met didn't we years ago what was it 2021 yeah um, and, and I think it's, it's a good uh, it's a good story to tell because it tells people about what you do. So for for you know if you go to I'll put Kevin's stuff in the links, but he's got his Instagram and it shows a lot of people that he's taking through this uh, experience and he helps people. Uh, you probably tell tell people a little bit more what what that can do for people. You you'll you'll be able to tell them explain it better. Sure. Yeah, I mean since I started, probably taken over three thousand people into the cold now and um I've sort of stopped doing <clears throat> sort of small <clears throat> excuse me mate <clears throat> I've stopped doing smaller groups um but I've taken in um quite a lot of people one to one and small groups couples um as opposed to doing these huge big uh, group sessions um there's there's benefit to group sessions but the real sort of um Processing begins when you get in the cold on your own, because generally I think that's when you need the most resilience is when we're on our own. Um, so <clears throat> all those people aren't there with you when you put your key in your door to your flat on a Friday night and you've not got anybody. All those folk aren't around. So it's no good with building resilience in a group. You need to be able to master your shit when you're on your own. So that's when you need to get in the cold. It's get in the cold at 3 a.m. in the pitch black. You know, that's where you see you. You know, it's really, it's cool. It's cool when you talk about this because a lot of people who don't know about it or maybe they're investigating about it. Maybe they're listening to this or they know who you are. They've seen you've taken a lot of high profile people into the water. You're, you're, you're very good at what you do. People feel safe with you. And they're getting into this water. They're working through their trauma. They're working through these barriers that they have in their life. They're pushing through. And it's kind of, it's like this new, for me, like a like a, this working class view of it. It's like, it's therapy, but we're not in a nice cozy office. And I'm not laying down on your couch. We're getting into it. And we're getting into our body, into our feelings. We're going there. And then we're having a little chat, aren't we? Is that kind of, would, would that be fair? <clears throat> yeah pretty much bang on mate yeah just having a a chat and generally what i've done over the past four years um mainly over the last sort of maybe three years of those four years is that i've taken people through a process of explaining their anatomy and their physiology and what happens in cold shock response in the body and explained how the body keeps the score and how on a on a, on a physical level even on a cellular level um, the cells of your body, the fascia of your body <clears throat> as a memory of its own and it's watching you. So uh, when you 
physically stress the body, it kind of regresses a little bit. It's something that you've experienced, witnessed, felt, um, and uh, been present in before. So everything that we kind of experience really is past. Although it's happening and it's brand new, the emotions, the feelings, like you said before we went on, before you press record, the emotions, the feelings, the sensations, the fears, it's all relived. We think it's new because the experience is new, but actually what we're feeling is it's already happened to us before. So it's relived. So basically the, the cold and the breath work, it can trigger the past. And um, yeah, and that's what we're trying to um, become resilient to is the past really, I think. Yeah, and um, change may be the, our stories. Everybody has a story, right? Everybody has this identity. Everybody has this narrative. Maybe voices from your dad, maybe voices from a, 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 a partner, uh, a bully, uh, the school ground. It could be, uh, you know, a conglomerate of these voices. And we can change that, can't we? We can realise that it's all, it's just noise. It's not real. Sure, sure. But it's but it's past. It's all it's happened. And I, you know, when I'm coaching people now, I'm doing workshops. You know, I use their full names. I stand up and point at them. Jazz Martin. It's it's specific, and then sometimes they even turn away. And it's like, oh God, don't don't do that. And and what is this turning away? It's it's avoidance. So it's a physical reaction to behaviour, and you know, this is happening every day to us or we don't know always know that we're doing it and, um, and one of those avoidance behaviors these days i think is holding your breath and that's something that you do from a very very young age even as a baby and when we're being chastised by our parents or being told off um we sometimes we hold our breath we hide we go upstairs we go into the covers we go in the wardrobe sorry trigger warning everybody by the way about this sort of talk um but those are the things that we do to find safety. And when we're finding safety, sometimes we do hold our breath a little bit. And that's some a part of our nervous system that's been a part of us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, you know, holding your breath to hide or be quiet from animals. And those habits, you know, we don't lose them as animals. That You know, we carry on having them uh, for centuries, you know, and... Uh, and sometimes to, to explain that, I explain it as a bit like your mum's got hold of you when you're a baby and the guy comes around from next door, he's got a funny hat on. It's like, oh, it's okay, you know, Bill from next door. It's like, uh -uh. Mm -mm. No, don't be daft, don't be daft. You know, have a look at this Bill, it's Bill. Mm -mm. But the baby, as a baby, you turn your head, you close your eyes, you hold your breath. And the reason that that happens is because you think if he can't see you, uh, sorry, if you can't see him, by closing your eyes, that he can't see you, and that that's a habit. And when you uh, when you talk to people, and you say specific things that are connected to their past, their eyes close. So, a lot of this jazz is about watching people's reactions to what you say and watching their reactions to the cold. You know, if you look at people getting into cold water tanks, everybody's doing this all over the world now. You get people going into cold, they do things like this. Their heads are down, their hands are together, their hands are up like this and their eyes are closed and they go inward. And a lot of the time they don't know they're doing it. It's a habit. So what we try and do when we take people into the cold is try and get them to avoid these habits of being uncomfortable and just be open to it. That makes sense. Sorry, that's gone everywhere, Jazz, but... No, I'm loving it, mate. I'm like Picasso here. I'm writing everything down. And if people want to wind me up, because I, I forget things and it's important to remember. And one of the things I put, I think in everyday life, humans, people who are watching this, we forget we're animals. We forget we're animals. And this is really feeding into that animalistic nature. It's getting back to our core. Like you said, running through us, through our DNA, it's our ancestors. It is these nasal breathers. It's these people that had to be calm in intense environments. We both love boxing, don't we? We love fighting. And one of the biggest things in mixed martial arts is stay calm nasal breathe 
Don't let your uh, adrenaline flood your body. Don't let it overtake you. That's something that happens when you get in the cold water and we'll get to it. I've worked with you with the cold water therapy and I've worked with you with breath work. And um, what happened with me when I first met you, the first time I was trying to get into the water, um, and I spoke about this on the last podcast, I believe, or one of my coaching videos, I was like, nah, it was too much. I'd flooded, the adrenaline had flooded me, and I was just like, nah, can't do it. Even though I'm a competitive person, even though that I've got my ego and my pride, it overwhelmed me. You've probably seen this before with people. You know, everybody's, um, it's it's one of those things. Actions speak louder than words, right? And uh, that's, what, that's where I was at. Should we, should we talk about that a little bit, Kev? Should we talk about what yeah. happened with me and that journey? And, and when you first met me and what was going on? I mean, you want to fill in sure. the blanks? Yeah, for sure. You know, obviously, I can talk about this because there's nothing. There's nothing that you haven't shared with the rest of the world. You know, and um, when we met up at James O'Keefe's Unguarded Warrior uh, Men's Retreat down in Sussex, uh, beautiful location, fantastic weather, uh, unusual retreat to say the least. Um, but you know, you turned up. I think you'd just been on a real kind of mad one, hadn't you? You'd been on a bit of a bender, a bit of a blowout. Um, and you just kind of last minute, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going. Then you decided, yeah, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. And, you know, it was obvious that you were, you know, you were struggling um, on that retreat. And it's just so confrontational, like, isn't it? Getting into a group with a lot of guys, you don't know who they are. And there was some, there was some alphas there and unusual um, sort of scenario to go into. And, yeah, really awkward you know, for, for men to, to turn up in them groups. And it was felt by by everybody, not just you, but the, the entire group. Um, but yeah, going going back to that sort of fear of trying to get out, sometimes when you get in the cold, it feels so uncomfortable and it's so regressive and there's so many other men watching you. It, it, it can sometimes make you feel as if you, you feel as though you may become emotional. And sometimes we're just not ready to let everybody see us in that way we and you know the getting out is the guard it's like mm -mm, no it's the same as the baby uh, no no so that's what happens people get out no i'm not doing it what um just before we continue on this because we will what would you say is a reason for that character for that person who's like uh nah not doing it load of bollocks and the narrative starts or this is a load of Okay, so there's been a switch around here. You'll see Kev's background's a little different and maybe we look a little different. We haven't aged a day, have we? Because it's only been less than 24 hours. We had a power outage over here in Brazil. So we're picking up the recording where we were. And uh, thanks for coming back, Kev. Thanks for your patience. Um, no, sorry. Yeah, appreciate it, mate. Really do. Um, I was asking you, we were talking about me, when I first met you, and I was getting in that water, but then I kind of had that attitude like, nah, this is a load of bollocks, and not for me. And there's probably people watching this that think the same thing. So I wanted to open the floor up to you to say, like, what would you say to somebody who maybe has this kind of, like, barrier up towards cold, cold water therapy, breath work, these kind of things? How would you sell it? Well, um, what I would say generally is, is that... Um... The, the barrier is like it's, it's probably like it's like a guard really it's um self-defense mechanism whatever whatever's caused that sort of self-defense apart from the fact it feels shit you know it doesn't, it doesn't feel nice you know anybody that says oh man i just love getting in the cold i'm like come on fuck off you don't love the cold you love how you feel afterwards it feels really shit at the time because you know depending on what temperature you're getting in you know, um, if you're getting into a temperature that's less than eight degrees Celsius, it starts to uh, activate uh, different uh, receptors on your skin. It starts to activate nociceptors, which are more like pain receptors, really, that are sensing potential damage to peripheral nerve endings or your skin. Uh, it's the same sort of mechanism that you get when you hold something that's red hot. It's, like, it's, a, it's a fast mechanism that gets you to, to let go. So if you're above eight degrees, then those nociceptors are not as active and it's a little bit easier to, to, um, to cope with and to, to acclimatize to. Um, so you, first of all, you don't need to get into an ice bath. You don't need to get into an ice tank. 
despite what Joe Rogan says and, and Wim Hof and and uh, Andrew Huberman and all these all these uh, on social media, you don't have to get into ice water. You know, you can get into anywhere from sort of below 20 degrees down to sort of maybe 10 degrees. So that's more than enough. So you don't have to get into this sort of frightened situation where you're, you know, you're puffing and panting and you're gasping and you're going through cold shock response. You literally can just get into a, a cool shower after you've had it on hot, turn it down to warm, and then just cool little bits of gradual each day. And then eventually your body will acclimatize. But the, the, the thing that's trying to get you out, what I think is, is probably, it's probably some of the past. So it's like, it's like, it's, it's like regressive. So there's all sorts potentially going on in that moment. If you're in a group session, it could be peer pressure. It could be if you're a guy and you know, you've had a certain type of past or background um, there might be some alphas there and they, they just change the environment or whatever. Um, or there might be, you know, females there and that changes sort of how you get in. So really to, to, to get the true mark of, of yourself, you're often better off getting in, in on your own. That was a big, a big asset explanation. That was like, <laughs> but, no, I liked it. And it made me think of a saying, I don't know where this came from, but face your demons. Getting into that water, you might have to face your demons. We're talking about the past and a little way to now, you know, to maybe frame that is with that kind of it's the autonomic nervous system, right? That's the what sure. that that, that uh, fight or fly and survival response. And mm -hmm. obviously that's gonna bring up some stuff. And um if you're not used to confrontation, if you're not used to these intense situations, or your go-to is avoidance or head down like you said or maybe you're a people pleaser or is this kind of right is is this does it make does it make sense kev 100 percent. yeah everything that you're saying there's right and you know people avoid in different ways sometimes you get people that come into the cold and they start laughing and there's nothing to laugh at you know we're on our own you know sometimes i'm guiding somebody in i'm walking backwards and they start giggling i'm like what are you giggling at <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't know. I'm just laughing. So is that a nervous laugh? So is that a, another autonomic response from the nervous system? You know, and on some occasions I say to them, you know, sometimes in a, in a social situation, do you laugh nervously? I do actually. Yeah. So is the nervous system trying to use what it used one other time in an awkward situation where you felt maybe socially uncomfortable? to get you back to safety, you laughed and then eventually you got back to safety and it was and it washed over the situation. Is it using that same mechanism as getting in the cold to try and get you to come out of it? It really, uh, as you're saying this, it really like, uh, it peels away the layers. You get to see somebody, don't you? It's kind of like, you just get, it's like in the boxing match. I love boxing because you get to see somebody, you get to really see who they are. Talk, talk's cheap, <laughs> what's happening? You go, oh, that's who you are as a person. And it's just, it's a, it's a, you get to see where someone is on that specific day. Obviously, it can change week to week, month sure. to month, year down the line. People work through things; they change. People are always evolving. But you do you sure. get to see, you get to see where someone is. It's funny you mentioned the laughing thing. I uh, recently did some therapy, and uh, I've done that throughout my life. Uh, just talk therapy in a in a room with a therapist, different styles. But the last one I had. And I might get him on here actually because he's um, he's a fantastic therapist and he works at the treatment centres that I work at. Um, okay. He said to me, um, "You're laughing at uh, things that are not that funny, to be honest, Jazz." Um, and I, I just, I'm like, "What do you want me to do?" But he pointed it out, and he was, he was just better, very matter of fact, and he's just kind of like, well, "Well, it's, I mean, it sounds painful to me what you're talking about," mm -hmm. and I had to, I had to go. Wow, am I, what am I, what am I, this is a coping mechanism, right? And it can happen, like you said, in social settings. So it's it's valuable because if you're not happy or you feel like you could level up in life, these are areas, for me looking at it, I'm like, well, this is why I might want to do it because I might want to work with Kev because this, I'm stuck in life. I'm not where I want to be. And I could, this could be holding me back, these little things. You sabotage your life, you sabotage relationships, you sabotage your career or whatever because of these little things. Is that is that, yeah. is that correct? How I'm looking at it and thinking about it? And... Yeah, because whatever happens in the cold water, if depending on how you regulate in the cold, 
you don't you don't leave it in the cold you take it with you so you're building a, a kind of or you're using the, the 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 cold stressor as as a tool to regulate response to stress and you don't leave that in the cold like so you take that away with you and if you keep on doing it it builds a certain you know a certain level of resilience so you tend to find that in those situations where you would normally sort of laugh nervously you would kind of sit back and be quite in control about the situation or just turn around and walk away if you felt uncomfortable in it or you would have the bollocks to say excuse me i don't think that's right it would change something would change about you and and that's really the potential of the of, of, of the cold not just the cold obviously but the work that comes with that so the, the you know you've got to understand the mechanisms of that you and i do you know we obviously but just joe blogs you know down the street whatever they're not really okay with what well, what's all that about autonomic nervous system parasympathetic sympathetic what's all that about so we've got to try to explain this uh, to, to people who are just you know just you know factory workers and and, and doctors you know it's about some doctors nurses paramedics teachers you know truck drivers you name it you know so it's it's, it's understanding it's connecting the dots jazz you know it's all right going to a place and going Woo, have a lot of fun and yeah, get it. oh my god Ooh, yeah. dance about have some breakfast yeah it was an amazing experience well what did you what did you take away from it uh, well i don't know it was just felt felt great for the rest of the day i'm going to go and do it again next week i'm going to do the same thing again yeah i'm going to go again I'm still not learning anything um so it's learn something knowledge is power when it comes to how you react to stress and your name breathe illusion Mm. off the bat if people so people might be connecting the dots here as i am because what happens is the main thing you just said you have the bollocks to speak up now one of the things is when you can't speak when you're frightened your breath you've held your breath you realize whether you're in a fight whether you're in a verbal altercation you can all of a sudden you're like and you can't breathe and you feel yourself and it's the same thing as going to into the water isn't it and that's where the rubber meets the road where you really have <clears throat> the power of your breath the power of like we said earlier in this conversation yesterday sure. going to be on this same timeline when we were hunter gatherers or whatever we had to stay calm we had to nasal breathe we had to keep our heartbeat at a certain level you know all these sure. cia agents all these uh, fbi agents all these people that are like um snipers they learn to control their breath right it's yeah. so important massively mate and you know and just you know going back to that sort of thing where you're holding you're catching your breath and you feel nervous and your heart rate starting to increase that's something that you did when you were a kid. That's why your nervous system uses it again, because at one time it got you out of shit. It got you, you got back to safety after doing that, after performing that, your body went through a, a certain, um, what is it now? I can't even think of the right word. Your body's gone through a certain program. Um, kind of, Progression. Yeah, like a certain program, a, a mechanism. Certain yeah. things have gone off at the same time, and the body has the capability of remembering that. Whether it was your dad, oh, he just get them, or when it's your school teacher, you start to get caught up or frightened, or somebody corners you, somebody, you know, your body's already done it. it, it this is the, the such an important thing about this is is their evolutionary lessons. So from the first, I know this is going way off piece, mate, but from the first cell on earth the first life on earth billions of years ago the first cell is it was it called luca the first cell on earth i know this goes against kind of religious beliefs and stuff but it, it does kind of inter, inter intermix if you if you look at it from, from different directions but the cell has got its own memory the cell has got its own capability of survival and you know the, the human body is made up of 30 trillion of those cells they all know what they're doing they're all doing their own thing it's a genetic masterpiece, the human body. It's a, it's a symphony of creation because it's taken millions and millions of years to get to this. So if we learn from evolutionary lessons, we learn that the organism starts in the safest place that it's, that it's ever going to be before it dies, the womb. And you, you start to exist inside another human. And 
you know, you're in the kind of most parasympathetic state you'll ever be in. And then the organism then witnesses some things, you know, very quickly. You're, you're pushed through a narrow canal at the end of nine months. And it's stressful. It's your first kind of stress, really. And maybe traumatic, depending on how you're born. If you've got an umbilical cord around your neck or uh, mum isn't doing so well or it's tight or, it, or there's certain things going on with, with you. You know, but you but you you're born into fear. The organism experiences fear and you gasp. And you come out and it's bright and it's cold and they cut the cord and you're separated from the safety. So that's your first experience. That's the organisms, the animals' first experiences, being safe and then unsafe. So then you've got to get back to safety again. For you to do your job, which is eat, sleep, procreate, and then die to, to perform your part here on Earth. You've got to go back to safety. And she does it. She picks you up and she feeds you. And eventually you become so safe, you fall asleep on the breast and you find parasympathetic state again, safety. So so really the, the, the nervous system is set up at that point, really, to, to, to sort of regulate you from this sort of um, safety to vulnerability, safety, vulnerability, safety, vulnerability, dopamine, no dopamine, serotonin, no serotonin. It's a complete wave all the time. You know, people, some women say that, well, when my baby was born, they weren't frightened. They weren't crying when they come out. They were like this. So we'll leave them then. Just put them on the floor. They'll start screaming eventually to get back to safety. It's the only thing we can do as humans. But the, the, the fundamental purpose, and Charles Darwin wrote about this in 1859 in his Origin of the Species, Jazz. He said that the fundamental purpose of human emotions is to instigate motion or mobility to get the organism back to physical equilibrium, which is parasympathetic state or safety. So, you know, we've known about this for a long time. So, so it, it, literally in that order, safety, vulnerability, safety, vulnerability. Which, so it's, that's the same thing in the cold. It's the same thing. And it was the same thing that happened to me. So I'm just looking at that and how I can apply that to what happened that weekend that I worked with you. And I probably didn't feel safe. I probably didn't trust you. Who's this guy? What's it all about? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, who are these? La, 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 la. But then I got to know you a little bit. We got to talk. We got to do breath work exercises. And then I'm like, okay, I like this guy. I trust him. There's a different energy. And you, what I could tell you wanted the best for me. And then I got in the water. I was able to do it. And I did go away and practice cold showers and things like that. And the next time sure. we met for a workout, um, it was really, it was something that, um, again, it's not easy, but it was something that because I felt safe, again, I felt really safe and I'd had evidence is the loudest uh, voice in the room. I'd had this evidence that this does work. This do I know what's going to happen. All of a sudden then I was dancing with it rather than being afraid of it. I think... What you I'll just finish with this and then you can probably got something you want to tag in or fill in the blanks on that journey. But um it's like that that's a bit that's a like that's a Mr. Miyogi for life. That journey I went on with the water and the breath work, that could be talking to a girl you fancy. That could be, you know, at work or that the, the stages of that. It could be asking for a rise off your boss. And it could be the stages at that. It could be having the bollocks to uh, go and chase a dream or go take a year off and travel to India. And, and, and there'll be stages to that. You can apply the same uh, feelings that are going on and use yeah. them in all these different areas of your life, right? So this is just a quick way to get to it. And and uh, get on that kind of bike of uh, evolution, et cetera, when it comes to this stuff. 100%, mate. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Just recognising your own, recognising your own shit, basically, recognising your own weakness. And this is why I said, I think I mentioned it earlier on in the one we did last night. So these people go to these events and they get into war with everybody in a, in a situation where it's, there's, there's loads of co-regulation because there's loads of people about. It's like, oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Then they go home and they get into four degrees warmer and they're like, shit, I had to get out. Didn't like it. Well, what's the difference? Well, I don't know. It was a warmer temperature. Maybe I 
Was it someone that had eaten? Was it someone that said, no, there was nobody there, was there? And that's the thing. And, and because the times that we've been most vulnerable, Jazz, is when we're on our own. Not in the situation, not when somebody's like this up in your face. It's afterwards, really. It's what that does to you emotionally, mentally, physically afterwards. When you get back into your bedroom and you're sort of, And I'm sorry, trigger warning there for everybody, but yeah, you're triggering me, that... bastard. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but yeah, that's <laughs> it's fear, and the, and and the body's the body's watching you do this. It's it's watching the way your hands are. That that they're, they're frightened. Your shoulders are up. You're 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 trying to get your breath. And you know how does it look when you get in the cold water? Similar, almost the same sort of. <laughs> So if you do that in the water, it's the body's going to be like, no, 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 that's that. That was you in the bedroom when you were ten out. So if you get into the cold like this, what's your nervous system think you're doing? It thinks it thinks you you're going somewhere where you've been before. You do this. How do I look? I look frightened. So don't get in the cold like that. You get in the cold like this. With you, with you in control, hands open, like this. This is why this is good. This is what we do to pray. When we go to hug somebody, it's arms open, it's safety. We don't go to hug somebody like this. So why get in the water like this or the shower? Ooh. It's going to put your nervous system already on the back foot before you've even stepped in. You're feeding the monster. You're feeding the fear. You're feeding the fear, aren't you? Kev, you said there, um, it reminded me of like people who train for things. And um, David Goggins has said, like, training with music is cheating. You know, you, you're cheating, essentially. Like, he'll say, like, yeah, I, I don't train. Like, he'll do it with himself. But he said it, it, he knows it's a form of cheating because it's like you've got that company, you've got that thing, you've got that. It's when you're alone with your own thoughts and when it's when it, that thought saying, quit, stop. You know, that's when it's I'm going to get a mate of mine, Regan Denton, on here, who's um, he, he got put away for some of the stuff he was doing in his life. And he was a former professional boxer. And now he's opened up his gym in Sheffield, the hood boxing gym, right. what I'm wearing here. But he always cool. tells me, I'll get him on the show to talk about this, like when he was in prison and he was in that cell and they closed the door. And he's told me this and he spoke about it before when we've we've talked online. Um, he had no one else to blame. And he was left with his self and he had to take responsibility for his decisions. It was him. And he knew no one was coming to save him. And so you were, I'll just piggyback there. You were triggering me a bit because recently I spent a bit of time in hospital and I'm in LA. I've got no family around. I've got, uh, so no close loved ones. Me, my loved ones live in Brazil. And I remember I was in there nine days and it was the same thing, man. I was like, wow, this is real life. Like no mommy and daddy. No, you know, whatever it is. It's like you're relying on this new nurse that's coming in every night. There's a shift exchange. She's probably part-time. She doesn't even work here. She's on a, you know, doing it with whatever they say. It's, you know, a, a company through a company and you, they're giving you pills and you, you, you're frightened again. And then you're getting everything. They're coming and taking your blood and all this. And you realize, and this is in life. But what Regan said to me, he was on, obviously I had my WhatsApp to talk to people. And Regan said to me, hey, I love you, bro. It's character building. And he knew what he knew. He, that was it. I love you, bro. It's character building. And that was that. Um, what does not kill you makes you stronger. There's, there's truth in that, right? And if you can push through these difficult things, like you said, it's not easy getting in the water. It's not easy having the patience to practice breath work. If you can do yes. these difficult things, perhaps you can apply it to other areas of your life. Uh, sure. Is there anything? There, there, there's a... One. There is actually a part in the brain. I was listening to a podcast. Um, um, I'm almost sorry. It was a Joe Rogan podcast. But there's a part of the brain. In fact, it was Goggins who was talking about this. There's a part of the brain that actually starts to grow. It's, it, it's, um, it starts to get bigger or, or, or more neurons start to develop in a certain part of the brain. Once you start doing things that are uncomfortable, once you start to do things that are difficult, and this isn't just a neurological thing. It's not just a mental thing. It's a physical thing as well, Jazz. So the minute you 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 give into it and you start to practice the cold water therapy, you start to get in the cold and you become more resilient to it, 
you actually change how you react to the cold and it stays in the body for months and months and months and months, you know? So it's, it's actual physical changes in the body, but not only that, if you start doing breath work, if you start going up mountains, you, you're going to different pressures, you go under the water, you're holding your breath, you've got the pressure of the water, that's affecting the body. It's affecting the body's resilience to different ends of the scales. If you make your blood a little bit too acidic sometimes and you make it a little bit too alkaline sometimes, it's the body's trying to fight for homeostasis. So if you push your body to these different levels, fasting is another thing, you know? You know, starve the body. You know, create an environment where the, where the human body can adapt. It's the, it's, the, it's the reason why we're all here is because we've been amazing adapters. And to, to do that, we've had to be stressed. Like you said, you mentioned before, you know, thousands of years ago, you're running away from a, a saber-toothed tiger. You know, we wouldn't have got up in the morning and eaten breakfast. You know, that wouldn't have happened. You know, we'd have got up in the morning and we'd have been struggling for food and we'd have eaten food and then we might not have eaten for a couple of days. That's how we evolved. So do we have to sort of start investigating the stresses a bit more rather than too comfortable? 100%. I, I think that there's some things that you can take credit for and there's some things you just got lucky or it's just, it's nature, it's not nurture. Because I'm, th yeah. I think there's, there's, I believe we've got, like you know, like when you say, "Oh, look at little Tommy; he's just like his uncle Tony. He does that thing, or look, he does, he does that thing with his toe that you do, Kev, or whatever it is, right?" But like yeah, think yeah. Of all the things the kids doing that the great 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 grandfather did that you don't even know that you know, it, we're, so many ancestral DNA running through us, right? Um, insiders, outsiders, the way we look, everything's and I because I, I was thinking obviously recently I've done a video, someone pulled a gun on me here in Brazil, and honestly, mate, it hadn't affected me one iota. Um, and I and there's people have called me and and uh, that are close to me and that are coaches and that have said, you know, I've worked with people, this has happened to them, it's took them out for a year, they've been like literally they've, they've not been able to do much for a year because it mentally fried them. And at, mate, it couldn't have got any worse for me. Dark road, no one about, lunatic, on a bike, big gun, just me and him. And I'm all right with it. I don't know why. I, I spoke, spoke to my dad about it and I made a decision. Certain things happen. I've laughed it off. But I, I don't think I can take credit for it. I, was, I think I have this knowing. I was walking around the other day and I thought, someone in my family has been through, through some stuff along the way of the line and he's inside me. Because... Sure. The, because I can't, it, it, that's not something you can prepare for. It's a little bit like I used to work with disabled adults and I still do, uh, but more intensely in the past. And I remember a lot of people would fall off from that kind of line of work because they couldn't cope. It was too much for them. And I don't know, sure. why, I don't know why I could, but I could. I had no problem wiping somebody's bottom. I had no problem shaving somebody. I had no problem showering someone. I don't know why. Again, I can't take credit for it. It was just in me. Again, someone, I, th I think some something in me, that cell, that genetic masterpiece that you talked about, I think I, there's, sure. a, there's, a, there's a color inside me that I can't take credit for. I think it came from my lineage, the Martins, the Calverts, whoever it was, whichever side of the family. <laughs> and um, so I do believe in all that stuff, mate. I really do. And the fasting... That's thousands of years old, isn't it? That's that's fa that's yeah. in biblical texts and things like that, you know. So they knew they knew there was something about this body that we have to. No, it don't matter what iPhone you've got. It don't matter how big your flat screen TV is. If you're not practicing these things, you're not going to be well. It's not going to make you feel any better. You can get the big car, but if you if you're suffering from greed, if you're suffering from gluttony, if you're eating all these processed foods, if you're taking short breaths all the time, if you're not nasal breathing, um. You're going to be in trouble. You're not going to be happy. And that's what we want to do, right? I mean, I know I do because I've been in pain myself. I've been unhappy. I've been at a point where, you know, I spoke to Hutton about it on this thing where you get to a point where you think, is there any point? And you don't want anyone to go through that. You think, God, I won't wish that upon anybody. I won't wish that upon yeah. the worst enemy to be in that point. Um, so that leads us on nicely to what you're doing now. You're a trainer. You're a trainer. You're training people up in this line sure. of work. Breath work, uh, cold water therapy. Tell us about it, Kev. Yeah, I will. And um, just literally, just because of what you mentioned before about genetics and passing down, you know that that's epigenetics. So you know, and, and that's super interesting. You know, they've been doing experiments and all right on mice, but you know, and mice and rat and rodents, 
but you know, the, the, there's a lot of similarities between human behavior and, and, and um, rodent behavior. But they, they did this amazing test where they would, they had um, a, a, lot, a group of male mice and they, they, they put the scent of cherry blossom in this, in this cage and then they'd give them a shock, electric shock on their feet. I know it's quite cruel, so sorry about that for the animal lovers, but they give them a shock on the feet and they kept doing this repeatedly. So eventually what they would do is they would just put in the cherry blossom smell and they wouldn't shock them, but they'd still freeze anyway because they were waiting for the shock to come. They bred those mice uh, with females and the offspring would freeze when they smelled cherry blossom. Yet they'd never been shocked. So we know that epigenetics is a is, is a phenomenon. We know that it's real. But yeah, so um yeah, so so you know, Google it. Google epigenetics. It's that, fascinating. Mate, that's so it's not and I, this is just a knowing inside. I've I've not heard about that. Um and if I have, no. I haven't remembered about it, but uh that was just a knowing in me. I don't know. You know, like you have a knowing. I'm, I'm trying to work it because I'm, I'm a bit of a just, I'm a, I'm a bit like a Paul Sykes. I have to go and have a sniff and have a lick and have a touch and then I'll tell you about it. I'm not so much I'm going to read a book and an audio, but I need to go and have a look and be about it. And then um, I'm just telling you from what it is, I'm going, all oh, right, yeah. So that's what it's like when I've heard people talk about this kind of stuff. Now I'm like, well, you know, that's my experience. And um, yeah, it's a real thing. It's yeah. a real thing. You so go. you know, plus you've been through some quite a bit of adversity in your life as well. Yeah. So that's probably going to help yeah. you when somebody's pointing a gun at you because it's like, you know, yeah. that's definitely going to help. You know, tough guy. So, cold cold water therapy, uh, cold water therapy instructor training. So that's that's what I'm doing at the moment, and the reason I'm doing that is because not everybody's good to get into an ice tank, and I mentioned that earlier before. Obviously, people that have got cardiovascular disease or They've got a history of epilepsy. Um, they have, might have certain um, uh, sort of conditions like urticaria, which is like a, an allergic reaction to the cold. It can kill you. So you have to be really, really careful. So this is literally training um, sort of wannabe cold water therapists to understand physiology and, anat and human anatomy, but to a quite high standard, really, because... You know, if you're going to explain to people what's going on in them when they're going into the water and explaining cold shock to them, what happens in their body, their physiology, one, you have to make sure that they're healthy and that they can do it. And the other is, is understanding, you know, and witnessing human reaction to the cold. And like I said, in the beginning of the the last bit of the video that we did, um, you know, I've, I've witnessed over 3,000 reactions to the cold and a lot of them sort of one-to-one -one in small groups. So, you know, you get to understand how people are going to react. You get to kind of read them a little bit, in fact. Uh, but you can only kind of gain that experience by by guiding people in. So, yeah, so basically I'm running courses at the moment in various locations up and down the country, just taking people through certain things like autonomic conflict, for instance, which is what you get when you have the right conditions in place. You put your head under the water. You've been in a, a tachycardic state to begin with when you, you you submerge or immerse yourself in the cold water. It's up to your shoulders. Your heart rate might be up to 100, maybe over 100 beats, which is what they refer to as tachycardia. And then if you hold your breath, take a breath in, hold your breath, and then go under, you, the, the cold activates this part of the head here, which is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. And that, what that does is it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. It's an ancient mechanism in the body, the, the sort of mammalian dive response or reflex to help conserve oxygen. That slows the heart rate down immediately. And when you come up for this sort of protracted or lengthened breath hold, that's when you're going to get these arrhythmias in the heart, when you get the, the two branches of the autonomic nervous system working against each other. So you go from a very high heart rate to a very low heart rate. Your heart rate might drop to about 45, 50 beats per minute from being at 100. And the heart starts to electrically bleh, flutter. Now, for most people that are healthy, just that's okay. But for people that have got a history of cardiovascular things like that, they should not be putting their heads under the water. In fact, it's even dangerous to even splash cold water in your face in the morning if you're not sure whether you have any sort of underlying health conditions because it activates this um, this autonomic conflict. So people really, really need to do their homework before they just take any Tom, Dick, or Harry into the cold. 
you know you need to make sure that people are healthy enough to do it you know you wouldn't say to somebody who's morbidly obese just stick a pair of trainers on we're going to go and run a marathon now <laughs> you wouldn't do it you know and you know i know you've got to be careful what you say these days but that's the amount of stress that you put on a body when you get into freezing cold water if the body's not used to it you get a gas this <clears throat> you release adrenaline your pupils dilate your, your increased cardiac output your heart rate increases you get peripheral blood vessel constriction all the blood starts to build up into your come back into your core and it puts the body under a lot of pressure jazz you know if you don't know what you're doing sometimes you can become you can come unstuck if you've got a history of migraines for instance you've got a, a very high chance of of, of uh, having something called um transient global amnesia which means you lose your memory sometimes for up to 24 hours it's frightening it's happened to me three times that you know and it's a very rare condition but it happens so if, if, so if it, people really need educating that's the point and 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 that's why they need to come to someone like you an expert an elite guy who's been there seen it done it over three thousand people like you said now you've got a feel for it you can smell it you can see it and you can help a lot of people and because this is a thing that's really taken off right on the internet all around the world it's a big thing but it's so, new it is fairly new it's a baby even though people have been doing it for centuries and we see people in scandinavia you know with the sauna and the cold water therapy etc yeah. so if you sure. have if you're watching this and you have got um you, you've got uh you, you're doing um uh, getaways you're doing retreats and things like that kev somebody that can help and get you qualified get you certified make sure you're you're keeping people safe that's what we want to do we want to keep people safe sure and you know look there's an element of risk with anything you know if you go out and jump out of an airplane with a parachute on your back it's a good possibility that you might not go home that day you know, if you, you know, if you'd go on a roller coaster, there's a good possibility that, you know, it could increase your heart rate enough. You could have a heart attack. So there's there's loads of risk involved with all sorts of things. But what we're really just trying to do is minimize that risk. So understanding medications, for instance, that, are, you know, the sort of contra, you know, indicative to, to getting into the cold, you know, that can sometimes, you know, change the QT interval of, of your heart. Um, I mean, I know this is sort of going a little bit sort of technical, but um, th they alter the, the, the wave pattern of your heart and, you know, things like antihistamines, you know, so if you're taking antihistamines in the spring and summer, you can increase your chances of arrhythmia. So it's just everybody should know that, though. And, you know, that's why when people are filling in waivers, they should put down any medication that they're taking, you know, but you can you can fill in as many waivers as you want. You can have as much insurance as you want. If you have something that's underlying that you don't know is there, then there is potential for you coming unstuck. So do you get into five degrees if you've never been in any cold water before? Certainly not. Absolutely, 100% do not do that. You know, make sure that you're healthy. Your doctor won't give you a note. For those of you guys at home in the UK, I don't know where, where, anywhere else in the world, but... In the UK, no one's going to say, no doctor's going to say, oh, of course you can, yeah, go and get into an ice tank this weekend, enjoy yourself at a festival. They'd never sign you off. So you have to kind of check for yourself. I mean, ideally, for me, Jazz, I'd like everybody to have an ECG before they did a cold plunge, but that's not going to happen. But I take blood pressures and I take people's temperatures before they get in the cold. And, um, you know, I make sure that they're healthy and I make sure that they're not on any medication that's... Um, that's problematic with cold shock. Well, that's a great one, and that's a great and that's good food food for 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 people. Um, Kev, last thing I wanted to just uh, ask you. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, by the way, mate. It's been brilliant. Loved all this. Uh, I'm going to use, oh, mate, that, use that. I'm going to use that genetic masterpiece on uh, my next um, my next uh, <laughs> my next outing, my next romantic outing. We we'll say you are a genetic masterpiece. I love that line. <laughs> Symphony, mate, an absolute symphony. It's the reason why we don't have eyeballs. <clears throat> we don't grow eyeballs in our teeth. There you go. I heard a lady say, a scientist. The reason we don't have eyeballs in our teeth because every single cell has its own job. You know, hair cells, skin cells, kidney cells, blood cells, water cells. You know, you name it. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of different cells. They're all doing their own thing. Yeah. You know, it's phenomenal, really. It's, 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 it's mind-blowing isn't it it's mind-blowing 
Yeah. I, I, and each one is a unique blueprint. None of us are the same. None of us are the same. No cell is the same. It's just remarkable. Yeah, it really is. Hey, so talking about cells, obviously oxygen goes into them and that's how we breathe and things like that. And um, sure. you know, the best, and I, I've done a few drugs in my life, but the be, one of the best ever highs I had was from doing breath work. I'd done it. I know I did breath work with you, but I'd done it at another camp and I'd done this breath work. And I'm going to get, there's another breath, breath work practitioner that I'm getting on here, this lady from uh, Los Angeles, but I, I'm going to ask the, like similar questions, but I just want to ask you a little bit about it because she doesn't do the cold water thing. Um, but I wanted to say like, what's going on there, man? Like why? I literally felt like I was on MDMA. Like I was, I went into this place where I was laughing, tears were coming down my eyes. I just felt, I felt in that, I felt like I was on my mother's uh, bosom again. You know, it was, it was crazy. It was unbelievable. That sounds a little strange, but you know, I'm trying to say like it was uh <laughs> the safest place you ever were, Jazz. Safest place you ever were. Um so the thing is with breath work, and you know, that's that's a word that's being sort of you know thrown around a lot recently. And you know, breath work means that you're working a little bit, you're breathing, but you're also working as well at the same time. And um, then there's breath practice and there's functional breathing, uh, breathing mechanics breathing biochemistry so there's there's all these different types of names and stuff but basically it's the first thing we do when we come out as we take a breath and your body has a as a way of remembering how you breathe there's a part of the brain called the pre botzinger complex it's just a group a small group of neurons in the brain it's named after a bottle of wine google it folks you want to google it it's really interesting and uh, jack Philman, i think his name he talks about it he in fact he Gave it, they 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 give it the name pre boxing complex. It's a bit like what the sinus node does in the heart. The sinus node is kind of controlling the the beats of the heart and the weight, the the, the patterns of the heart. Your your boxing complex is controlling your your breathing, but also your your body is making a score of how you're breathing too at the same time. And this is constantly monitored by chemo receptors in your body that are monitoring oxygen levels, CO two levels, hydrogen ions. It's, it's, it's monitoring your blood every split second to make sure that you're at homeostasis balance between 7.35, 7.45 on the pH scale in your blood to keep you alive, to acidic you die, to alkaline you die, simple as that. So your breathing is critical. It's the first go-to is respiration to, 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 to monitor your blood pressure and to monitor your blood volume and to get oxygen to the brain. And we've got more oxygen to this brain than any mammal, which is, you know, we're the dominant species. And that's because of a unique diaphragm that we have. But breath work, you're talking about breath work, rather than I won't go into biomechanics uh, with people's breathing. You should be breathing through your noses. You've mentioned that already. Um, taping up at night is a good idea. Um, not for everybody, but there's a lot of people taping up at night now. We could talk about a little bit about that, or maybe on the next one or whatever. But breath work. If you hyperventilate, yeah, which is what breath work is, is what the, what we're referring to. Like the people are getting into these group sessions now, or maybe maybe one to ones as well, which I do one to one work. You hyperventilate the body. The body's been there before. Okay, now the body doesn't really like to hyperventilate. It just wants to breathe normally, so that you're getting the optimum amount of oxygen. If you start to hyperventilate, if you lie down in a tent with twenty people, and there's a guy like me saying. Take a big deep breath in, let it go, fully in, or like Wim Hof, fully in, let it go. What happens is, is you offload too much carbon dioxide. You 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 caught you have what they call CO2 washout. So you it's a big deep breath. You start to get a bit lightheaded. Because actually what you're doing is actually you're you're actually removing oxygen. From the I brain. Was cramping up in my fingers. You're reminding me now. I was cramping up in my fingers like this. I was like, yeah, cool. was, I was really like, I was like, what is going on? But they told they told us to just keep going no matter what happens. So I remembered like I was <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, tetany. I'll explain a little bit about how that works. But basically, when you hyperventilate, yeah, at that point when you start to hyperventilate, you've probably got about 96, 97, 98 percent oxygen in your blood. So you're not loading the body with more oxygen, as it suggests sometimes in like the Wim Hof method. 
you know, breathe fully in, load the body with oxygen. You may get an extra 2% maybe in the plasma of your blood, but you're not over overloading the body with oxygen. That's not what's making you lightheaded. What you're doing by washing out the CO2 is you're, you're changing the mechanism of how oxygen is released into your brain and how oxygen is released into your body, in fact. And by offloading too much carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide you're actually washing away a, a chemical in the body that, um, that controls blood vessel dilation. So you actually end up restricting blood vessels. Okay, so you end up actually restricting blood vessels to the brain and re restricting oxygen to the brain, uh, which is the effects that you get and the kaleidoscope effect and the colours and the light. And it's like, whoa, man, yeah, this is amazing. But it's, it's the lack of oxygen that's causing that. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, it, you get to a certain point where, you know, sometimes the brain thinks you're dying. You know, people pass out. You know, they become so hypoxic, which is low oxygen, that people actually flake out and pass out at these breathing events. You know, this happened at Russell Brand's event. Somebody told me that there was next to a kid who had a black, he, he had a seizure. He blacked out and then he had a seizure. And he'd come around, he's like, oh man, it's so cool. I've had a seizure. Whoa, yeah, it was amazing. But not clever. You know, not great. So again, it's one of those things that you have to be careful. You know, you've got your foot on the accelerator and the brake, you know, so you go as comfortable as you want to go. Okay. You can be pushed, but you can be pushed too far. You know, this isn't always necessary, this tetany, this cramping of the fingers, you know, that's that's really changing your biochemistry. I want to just come in here, Kev, because I think this is important to say, look, in this line of work, when you go into these retreats, you're getting people that are coming to work with you. It's a, it's a real privilege. And you're getting people like me or like others that at the time when they come there, they might be in a vulnerable state. And a lot of people are very vulnerable emotionally, but also a lot of people physically, but emotionally. And they, and they can be, you know, that it, like I said, it's a real privilege. So it's so important that people are coming and getting properly taught and they're not just doing this they're not being a cowboy they're not trying to just be like yeah yeah all right yeah you know what i mean like well oh, go on then we'll just have a breath or whatever you know it's like no you've got to go get your training because you've got people's lives in your hands and also sure. you've got you, you you've got like we said it's about keeping people safe you've got um people's uh what would you say it's like they're um it's the it's their mind. You've got their mind, their mental health. It's their mental health, and um, you know uh, when sure. you uh, when you're dealing in this subject matter, you better be a bloody expert because it, it is a privilege. And um, you know, uh, like you said, sometimes it, it can it can end in tears, uh, mate. So you're a yeah. teacher, which which, 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 which you do, which he does a lot of the time. You what, Paul? Which it does a lot of the time, you know, and like you've just said, and you've 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 hit on something that's mega important, Jazz. And when you go into the enter into these breath sessions, you know, sometimes you take the lid off Pandora's box, but you can't put it back on again. You know, so sometimes people are going to these events and they're having these moments, and then they see these people, or they witness these things, or they become emotional, and they un they unravel something that they've perhaps not felt for nearly 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years. And they come away saying, wow, it was an amazing experience. And they go home, it's like, God, I just can't unsee it. I don't feel right. But by then, it's too late. It's already happened. So really, there has to be, once you go into one of these um, breathing practices or breathing sessions, you need somebody maybe just to help you integrate back into normality after it. So that's why there's, there's regulation needed there. And I'm no expert on breathwork, Jazz. That's not what I do. I'm not a qualified breathwork coach. I'm not, you know, I'm Oxygen Advantage, I'm Buteco, I'm Nervous System Regulation, that's what I do. And I'm a cold water therapist. You know, there's loads of amazing, you know, breathwork coaches all over the world. Some are good, some are not quite so good, you know, and that's the way the industry's going at the moment. You know, I'll mention Steph at Seven Directions Breath in uh, in England, you know, she's amazing. Um, Steph Magenta, you know, she's, she's amazing at what she does. You know, she teaches breathwork instructors. You know, um, she teaches people how to hold safe space, Jazz, you know, which is what I'm doing with cold water therapists. 
Well, we're going to put all the descriptions to your upcoming events uh, and your uh, Instagram and getting in touch with you. That'll all be in the in the description. Like you said, you still sure. do one. You work with a lot of high profile people. You work with people that you know are elite at what they do, and then they come to you to help them become more elite at what other things that they're not so great at. Kev, let's finish on the. Uh, just tell us, uh, you know, some some of your. Um, success stories with people like people that you've took in the water changed their lives and what they've been able to go and achieve or what they've worked through or if there's anything you can share for us just for that you know for people that are going yeah, on there's been, yeah there's been so many jazz you know i mean if you go to brevolution.com you can see some of the testimonials and feedback uh on there and and literally it, <laughs> i just i just couldn't put them all on not on uh on uh, on the website there's just so many of them and so for some people it's been life-changing jazz you know just from people that are all of a sudden they're sleeping better people that have managed to break away from addictions like it did with me people that have managed to come off medication that they've been on for years people whose skin's cleared up people who fell pregnant you know there's been loads of success stories loads of happy endings you know and for some people it doesn't work though jazz that's this is another point as well is that sometimes cold water just isn't for you. Sometimes breath work just isn't for you. It might be just, uh, you know, aggravating something in your nervous system that just doesn't isn't going to work for you. Try Reiki. Go to yoga. Do something else. Do Pilates. You know, go and get in an oxygen chamber and a hyperbaric chamber. Do do whatever you can. If you know, find what's what's right for you. Um, but the, but the the cold is an amazing stressor. You know, and like you know, Wim Hof's done some incredible things in, in bringing this. To everybody's attention the cold water and he has it's you know it's, it's amazing what that guy's done um but yeah it's, it's it's not for everybody but yeah there's been some incredible stories mate there really has and i've got you know over the past four years i've had an opportunity to work with some amazing people and especially with people that i was working with during lockdown who were really stressed and really fed up who witnessed some horrible things you know there's nothing i've not heard or witnessed in, in this four years. It's been really heavy on me, Jazz, and uh, almost to the point of burnout. Uh, and it's cost me as well. But it has given me um, a unique take on human um, condition, I think, you know, I'd like to say. And, uh, and it's taught me an awful lot. You know, pe the people that have come to see me, Jazz, have taught me far more than, they've, than I've taught them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think everybody should just, you know, before you go and get tablets, before you go to the doctors and take the pills and, you know, puff on the inhalers, there are other ways of, of, of making subtle changes and, um, you know, just, just getting, um, marginal gains each day. And, and then you're going to be, you're going to be better off than than just, you know, putting a sticking plaster over something. Have a look. Have a look at why. Uh, why, why you're poorly, you know, rather than trying to fix it with something else. You know, there's a reason for it. You know, I'm not trying to poo-poo medication. I said that on the, on the bit before. But um, because it helped me once, it saved my life once, mate. It's the Talipram, sertraline, the antidepressants, they saved me. Um, but you know, there may be another way out of it. Somebody might be able to help you connect the dots and put the pieces of the jigsaw back to, together without maybe. Well, life's seasonal, isn't it? It's seasonal. And sometimes you're not ready for that level 10 book. You need, you need to start at level three and then you, you finish your level three, you got level four, level five. You might need that tablet. You might need that little thing. And then eventually you might go down five milligram and you then you might start running as a hobby or whatever. And you'll get to this place where you think, I might try a retreat or I might try some breath work or I might try some cold water therapy. These things evolve. We're always evolving. Like we said, I think just listen to you there, Kevin, people can go on to, uh, uh, to your website and they'll see the testimonials. They'll see your story and everything, but I think it'd be a great, that'd be a great way to finish this chart would be your testimonial, how it, how it saved you. You've mentioned it's changed your life. You've mentioned it's helped you with addictions and what, what was the, uh, just give us your, um, 
pathway into now where you are today, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, at, the top of your, at the top of your game in this particular area? How did that come about for you and how did it change your life? Um, purely by, by fluke, really, um, because I was obviously I was struggling with addiction, uh, alcohol and, and um, cocaine for, for a while as well. I had a bunch of bit of debt with that. And, um, and yeah, I think the, the, the final push really was my, my sister died in 2019, Yvonne. She was only 49. And, you know, part of her death was linked to alcohol because she was a chronic pain sufferer. And she was drinking quite a lot. We just didn't know it at the time. And she was taking a lot of painkillers and stuff. And, you know, after, after she died, I almost drank myself to death in grief. It was awful. And, you know, eventually I just I, I just stopped. And I'd been stopped about six months, um, six to eight months maybe. And I'd read Wim Hof's book maybe a year prior to giving up. This is obviously about you know, over, four, over four years ago. Um, becoming the Iceman. And I didn't really try any breathing or anything, but I tried some breath work on the deck in one day. And, uh, you know, and I cried, I sobbed. And um, it's just a very simple a Wim Hof method, I think it was at the time. And uh, it was, I was fascinated. I thought, you know, why am I crying? You know, and the missus come out at the time. So, are you all right? I'm like, yeah. What's the matter? I, said, I don't know. <laughs> so, but I just, you know, I want to feel it again. It feels amazing. So I did it again, I did it again, I did it again. And then by chance, I met up with a guy um, and he said, I'm going to go and have a dip in the reservoir. So I went with him and got into the water and um, I was fascinated by how I reacted to the cold and by regulating your breathing, how how that completely changed everything. And you, for the first time, after about two or three weeks of the breath and the cold, for the first time in maybe 18 years, the first time I didn't want a drink, as opposed to not needing one. And that was that was a game changer for me. Um, and then shortly after that, then I started taping up. My sleep improved. Everything improved. Um, and, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Just, you know, by chance, I just felt like, yeah, I'm a mechanic by trade. I'm not, you know, medically trained or anything like that. But I know a fair bit about anatomy and, and, and physiology, you know, enough that, Sometimes I'm explaining to doctors certain things that they forgot. So, uh, so well, it's been yeah, it's been an interesting journey, Jazz. Mate, it brings us back like a little bit to that epigenetics. Is it epigenetics you were talking about? Um, yeah, maybe it was in you, mate, all along, and then just you've found home, you've found true north. Maybe John the Baptist was in your lineage. You never know, pal. <laughs> who knows who knows who Absolutely. knows but it seems like all the dots have connected and you know it's funny um you hear things many stories are told throughout you know thousands of years how things come about but it's that kind of sixth sense it's all come together now you being a mechanic you living your life you going through all this stuff i mean grief god i can tell you about that having gone through a divorce with a with a child and that child living in a different country and stuff like that and wow yeah. it's Grief is a, a terrible thing with people and that, and the stress that that puts on you uh, physically, mentally, spiritually. And then all those experiences you've had, and then you've found this way that you can tap in. And like you said, it's like when somebody kicks a football at you and you either, you, you, you can, I can tell straight away if he's a player or not, just the way he touches that first pass, like the way you'll go, oh, he ain't got a clue what he's doing. Or yeah, you know it. And a guy walking down the street who plays rugby won't know that. But it was in you, wasn't it? It was just the knowing. It was just, and it's got, and obviously you've been there, you've done the footwork, you've you've done the miles, you've been around other practitioners, you've been around other facilitators, you've you've paid your dues, and you are where you are, and your work speaks for itself. So I'll give you one. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on Sinner to Winner. Being a Sinner to Winner yourself, you know. I like Absolutely, it. mate. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm trying my best not to sin these days, but you know, it's always a battle, and you know, you're not nobody's on their own, are they? You know, we're, we're all we struggling. We're all doing the same thing. Yeah, we are not saints. It's this is progress, not perfection. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about sinning anyway, because apparently somebody died on the cross for that, so we're all good anyway. <laughs> Thanks to JC. Thanks to JC. Arcom Deus. <laughs> Thanks, my mate. Thank, thanks so much for inviting me on. It's been lovely to see you again, Jazz. And 
you know, I've missed you, mate. I really have. And, um, you know, I was blessed that, that I met you that day. It was such a fun time, that that retreat we went on with Unguarded Warrior. It was, it was good fun. Yeah. Um, Nothing else, mate. We got to meet each other. And I'm sure, like, like I've, I'm trying to connect you with some people. I should be back in the UK later this year. So hopefully I'll be able to connect with you and we'll get some face-to-face. That'd be amazing. Yeah. That'd yeah. be great. Maybe we, maybe we meet up in that gym in Sheffield and I can take him through Oxygen Advantage and, and do some stuff there with him and okay. maybe have a bit of a day there, do some networking maybe. Yeah, that's it. We'll get Dom on this podcast. I'm still, I message him all the time. He's uh, sure. he's over in Dubai at the moment. He just went to that Saudi Arabia fight. But nonetheless, brother, smashed it today. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you so much, mate. Thank you so much. Speak to you soon, mate. Take care.